gold just passed $2,000 an ounce, setting the stage for a historic new bull run. Multiple billionaire investors are loading up on gold, including hedge fund founder Ray Dalio and real estate mogul Sam Zell, meaning now is the time to own gold. One precious metals expert is stepping forward with a big prediction. He believes we could see gold reach as high as $3,000 by the end of the year, possibly higher. So find out why and get instant access to his number one gold investment for 2022. It's not bullion, an ETF, or a mining stock. In the past, folks using the same gold strategy could have been able to make nearly 50 times their initial investment. Considering how quickly the price of gold has been moving, you don't want to waste any time missing out on the gains he believes are in store for this investment. So to get a copy of his new free report with all the details, simply go to 2022goldmania.com. Again, that's 2022goldmania.com for a free copy of his new report. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone and welcome back to Stansberry Research. President Joe Biden will be meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping as the US leader looks to shore up global pressure on Russia to halt its war in Ukraine. Joining me today to talk about this and more is Professor Steve Anke. He's a professor of applied economics over at Johns Hopkins University. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Daniela. So we have a few items to talk about, but let's start uh, with the most recent here. Uh, and Biden's meeting with uh, Xi Jinping. Is this purely a symbolic move, do you think, Professor? Or, or can something actually come out of it? I think it's per probably more symbolic than everything else, but uh, you never know. Accidents can happen, but uh, it, it, it was kind of a, shall we say, impromptu. I doubt if it's very well planned. You have to practice the five Ps, especially in diplomacy. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. And the President of the United States is not noted for his 5P embrace and diplomacy really isn't his strong suit. So I, I don't really anticipate much to come out of it. But the interesting thing, I mean, there are two points that are interesting about China. Yeah. I mean, China, China uh, Look, looks like it, it probably will uh, benefit uh, or become opportunistic and, and maybe benefit as a, as a result of all these sanctions that are being thrown on, on Russia. So that's, that's one point. So I, I doubt if China will be in, in, a, in a mood to be negotiating much of anything. The second thing is that I think uh, China should be or could be delivering a message about how to control inflation because the inflation rate in China is less than 1%. It's, it's, it's nine tenths of a percent. And the reason why the Chinese know what they're doing, they know what causes inflation. Inflation is always caused by too much money being emitted in the economy. And they've controlled their money supply. They practice the orthodox quantity theory of money and they're controlling inflation. So they have all the so-called supply chain problems. I listened to Chairman Powell yesterday uh, after the FOMC meeting and he's still going on and on about supply chains causing inflation. It's utter rubbish, nonsense. The money supply in excess is what causes inflation. And obviously the Chinese know this, the, the Americans, the Federal Reserve is, appears to be almost clueless. I mean, this, this narrative has been going on and on. It is just a narrative. It has no factual or analytical basis. This supply chain thing, supply yeah. chains do not cause inflation, supply chain and interruptions and so forth. They cause changes in the relative prices of different items that are crunched in the supply chain, but they don't cause the overall level of inflation to change. The only thing that does that is changes in money supply. Um, so two very solid points, and I wanna get back to inflation in the, Fed, in the Fed in the first, but first your first point about China benefiting. Um, let's talk about how they would benefit. And I wanna bring up the recent news of Saudi Arabia considering accepting uh, the yuan instead of dollars uh, for Chinese oil sales. Is that one of the benefits that you're using as an example? The, the U.S. has been 
sanctioning and interfering, for example, with the SWIFT system for transfer of international payments, and that, that's a dollar-based system, but, but they uh, you know, tr essentially trampled on uh, property rights associated with that. And as a result, a lot of countries are, are getting a little spooked about being maybe too embedded and too right. wound up with a dollar-based system. So they're looking for other things. Saudi Arabia, clearly, that, that was a dramatic statement that they're considering moving into the WAN. Obviously, Russia is moving into the into the WAN and 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 closer relations with with China. So, so that's what happens when you start weaponizing a financial system, and that's what that's what the United States has done. We 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 are in war right now in a war mode. We've weaponized, unfortunately, the dollar-based financial system. In the short run, it has essentially no impact on, on anything. In fact, the dollar is extremely strong as a safe haven currency right now. But in the long run, it makes that system vulnerable because the property rights in that system are not secure. So professor, if it placed, if it places the US dollar in danger down the road, did they not think of that as a repercussion, a serious repercussion? Well, they don't, they, they, it, it's, it's kind of a, a, an asymmetric thing going on. They, they, they view the damage that is being done by imposing sanctions on Russia. That's one side of it. But the unintended cost, we don't hear anything about this. The, the politicians in Washington do, do not, if they, if they think about it, they certainly don't enunciate it and, and make it public. They, they will not tell the public that this is costing an arm and a leg by those who impose the sanctions, meaning, being, meaning the U.S. and so forth. This isn't a free lunch. If you impose sanctions, it, it is not a free lunch. And, and I want to talk more about that, uh, about the, the sanctions and the economic fallout um, you know, you recently tweeted that both the US and the UK have placed bans on Russian oil. The rest of Europe might not be enthusiastic followers. Europe's rush to renewable has left it energy deficient and dependent on Russia. Uh, let's talk about what Europe's options are here. Well, Europe's options aren't very good. And the, re the, and the reason for that is that they, they've gone whole hog in, into this uh, green uh, mode of, of thinking about energy. And, and so they, they have a lot of windmills, they have a lot of solar, but of course the, the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time. And they have ended up with a huge energy deficiency, Germany being of course the worst because they're decommissioning nuclear power stations and coal and, and they have a huge energy deficit and, and they had been intending on relying on continuing importation of Russian oil and gas to fill the deficit. Well, if you, if you cut the oil and gas off coming from Russia, you have a big hole. <laughs> and, 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 and this is a big problem in Germany that's, that's a big industrial power. They, they use a lot of electricity. You have to think of Germany, you know, one way to think about it, it's just a big car factory. And car factories use a lot of electricity. So they have a big problem. The only one that's thinking ahead is France. And France now is, the, of course, the leader in nuclear power. And, and they're going back into commissioning more uh, nuclear power stations. So the, the French have, they're logical and thinking properly about where, where they're going with energy because they know not only nuclear is safe, they have a lot of experience with it, but, it, but it's also very clean. So that's the, that's the direction they're going in. But the others are way behind the curve and, and, in, and in a lot of trouble in the energy sector. It will just be interesting to see how, what negotiations will look like two, three years down the line, Professor. I mean, how does Russia come back at the table. Now I know time will 
you know, has people forgetting. We've seen it with the Germans, we've seen it with the Japanese, we've seen it with Russia before. How does that play out? What does it look like for you? Well, uh, we, we don't really have any Talleyrands at the table. And so it, it's a, you know, it, it, it looks a little bit like amateur hour when you look in the dip, diplomatic sphere. Really, they're, it's populated by a lot of lightweights. So it's, it's very hard to tell what's going to happen. Uh, Professor, I want to talk uh, what you, you brought up before, inflation. Uh, now, President Biden jumping on this narrative that, you know, blame Putin um, for, for the imp- inflation, which I know infuriates you, <laughs> infuriates you. He's been, you know, saying, go out on TikTok, educate the people that it's Putin's fault about the price hikes. Um, you know, just some, just some thoughts on, on, on the rhetoric that's out there. Well, a, a, a recent Wall Street Journal poll said that they, it, uh, 52% of the American population didn't think President Biden would run for a second term because of, uh, you know, the alleged deterioration in cog- cognitive facilities, me- meaning, you know, the guy's probably missing a few marbles, but, but uh, this, this is what you get. I mean, he's playing with TikTok, <laughs> talking about inflation. I mean, it, it's pretty ridiculous. And, and it's, it's pretty ridiculous, actually, listening to the chairman of the Federal Reserve yesterday going on and on about supply chains. The supply chain problem has lasted longer than we thought it would. And therefore, inflation hasn't been temporary. It's, it's been somewhat persistent. He, he fails to even mention the fact that since COVID, February of 2020, the money supply measured by M2 has gone up by over 41%. Now that's, a, that's about a, on average a 20% increase in the money supply on an annual basis. And if you look at that 40% plus increase in the money supply, of course, some of that uh, accommodates real economic growth and some accommodates the increased demand for money but you're still left with about a 30 percent increase left in what i call a monetary bathtub that has to go over the bathtubs overflow Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. the overflow is inflation so that is already in the monetary bathtub that 30 percent increase that will seep out no matter what the fed does into inflation. And I think we will continue, as I have accurately indicated with John Greenwood in July of last year, that the inflation would end the year at 6%, maybe as high as 9%. We're right on target using the quantity theory of money to make that forecast. And it looks like those numbers are going to hold and be with us until we go into 2024, no matter what the Fed does. But the problem with the Fed is they're not even looking at the money supply. The money supply is still growing at 12.6% per year. And to hit their target of 2%, that number should be not 12.6%, but around 5 or 6%. I was going to say, I'm surprised you don't think inflation is running higher because I've heard some experts saying they actually think it's running at 15%. Well, I, I, again, if, if you're really if you're using the orthodox quantity theory of money, which, by the way, the, the Chinese that I mentioned, they are, they know what they're doing. If, if you look at the money supply carefully and run the numbers properly, yeah. you, you come out with exactly the number that Greenwood and I came out with. And now, now you can run, we, 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 run the quantity theory of money and equation of exchange and make some, we vary the assumptions a little bit. And that's why we get the range of 6% to 9%. You, you, you can make different assumptions and, and put them in. We mm-hmm. think we have realistic ones. And I think 15 is, is, is way too high. But let, let me ask you, uh, Professor, we see now the news of the week, uh, the Fed looking to fight inflation uh, with their first uh, interest rate hike um, in, in, in uh, over three years. Um, but you say of this, it's too little too late. 
To stop this mess, the Fed must cut the current excessive rate of U.S. money growth in half. Uh, what would it take to do that, to cut it in half? Well, they are talking about interest rates. That's all they talk about. But remember, to, to quote Milton Friedman, monetary policy is not about interest rates. It's about the growth and the quantity of money. And, and to slow the growth and the quantity of money, one, one way, if you, if you just look at these increases in the federal funds rate, that, that can lead eventually to a slowdown in the rate of gro growth in the money supply. However, the linkage between those increases in the federal funds interest rates and changes in the money supply are, are a, li a little bit loose. And so if you are using the interest rate, you, you've got to have the money, money supply in your dashboard. You've got to be looking at it. So if you increase the federal funds rate 25%, 25 basis points, I mean, 25 basis points, and you plan on six more increases and, and getting things up to, you know, one, one, one and three quarters or 2% federal funds rate by the end of the year, something like that, which now the markets actually think that the Fed's going to follow through and do that. You've got to be watching the effect that those increases have on the money supply. But to do that, it's like flying a plane. To know your altitude, you have to have an altimeter in the plane. If you don't have an altimeter, you, you have a problem. You might, you might be flying low and crash into a mountain and, and you know, not even know it's coming. So you have to have the money supply in the dashboard. The Fed does not. So the, the Fed is too little too late, but they're also flying blind because they're not looking at the money supply. Now, the other, the other more direct way, by the way, to deal with growth in the money supply is to shrink the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And, and, and the chairman of the Fed, Paul, did mention this and said maybe, maybe by May, they would start thinking about or doing something with the balance sheet, shrinking it. But he was very vague. He didn't say what they were going to do or, or, or anything. It, it was a very strange remark. It was just a kind of a footnote in his, in his speech. But that's how you really control a money supply. Mm. <laughs> you, 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 you control it through that mechanism, and it, that's pretty direct. And, and you know what's going to happen with the portion of the money supply that's being supplied by the Fed. Now, changing the interest rate, the Fed funds rate, that, that affects the, more the commercial banks and the commercial bank portion of the money supply that's be, being created by them privately. Just one final point, uh, Professor Pika, since we last spoke, uh, we've seen an executive uh, mandate out on, on crypto regulation and, and, and buried in it was talk of a, of a Fed uh, digital dollar. I'd like to get your thoughts on how far away you think we are from that. Well, the, uh, I, I don't know because I'm not a party to the deliberations and, and studies that they're doing at the Fed, but, but they, they are studying it. They're, they're talking about it. They're kind of moving in that direction. Uh, under the hypothetical, by the way, a lot of people, you know, get get themselves all agitated about the digital dollar. But we are already we have the digital dollar. Most of the U.S. dollars produced in the United States are actually produced by commercial banks, and and that's all digital. They, they don't produce notes and coins at commercial banks. The 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 U.S. government the U.S. government does that. So most, uh, most of the money supply in that M2 number, by the way, almost all the money being produced is, is digital right now. But a digital dollar would simply mean uh, if we went whole hog 100% for a digital dollar, that would simply be notes and coins being produced by the US would no longer exist. Everything would be plastic. Right. But the main difference is everything. I hear what you're saying, how we're already digital, but they don't know if I'm going to go buy a pack of gum with, you know, my five dollar bill right now down the street. Well, no, you'd, you'd have five dollars in, in, in your in your debit card. 
Right. If I mean, I'm paying you, you debit, just, but I'm saying the you, cash you system, buy, right? It's the issue of privacy. With, yeah, you just buy it with a with a, this plastic digital, rather rather than having a, a wallet filled with dollar bills or a coin right. purse with coins in it. That. So, so in principle, not, nothing would change. In, in fact, in terms of monetary policy, in no, other not words, in terms, but in terms of privacy, it would change. Oh, in terms of privacy, of course, it would change because they'd be monitoring everything you do. Exactly. Well, yeah. To your point, that's why folks are a bit up in arms and concerned. Yeah. Well, I, it, yeah. no, no, it, it, it would change the, the privacy thing. Of course, that's why the Chinese. Back to the Chinese. The Chinese communists, of course, are very intrigued by a, a digital wand because if, if they had a digital wand, they, they would be able to track every single purchase that every, every Chinaman made. Everyone using the wand would, would be under the kind of Orwellian microscope of the, of the Communist Party. Well we, well, we shall see how we'll, it will play out and we will keep inviting you back, Professor. I appreciate your thoughts today. Good, good to be with you, Danielle. Have a good day. Always good conversations with uh, Professor Steve Hankey over at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you so much for watching this edition of Stansberry Research. We'll have more coming your way. And don't forget to sign up for premier content at daniellacombonin.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.